Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Syed. As uh, Reid said, I'm a product manager for Amazon Web Services. Um, and this session is really about media processing. And, and in terms of media processing, really what I'm going to cover is talking about transcoding content and securing content and also working with the content once it's in AWS. So we have an agenda. So first, I'll spend about 10, 15 minutes talking about media processing. Then I'll turn it over to Sam, who's the uh, CEO of uh, Elemental Technologies, one of our uh, transcoding partners. Uh, and he's really be going to be talking about hybrid transcoding workflows, so moving from on-prem to cloud-based transcoding. Uh, then we'll hear from Raj from Ericsson, who'll be talking about cloud-based uh, content management systems. And then finally, we'll hear from Intel, who'll be talking about uh, high-performance media processing. So what I want to do first is to um, try and pull together some of what you've heard today. So you know, you, we, we've heard so far this morning uh, an overview of AWS. We've heard a lot about uh, customers and what they're doing with AWS. What I really want to do is to tie together some of those concepts and explain how they can be used for actually handling media processing workloads. Um, the first thing is that when we think about AWS overall, there's really you know, three main areas um, that, that Amazon Web Services focuses on. You know, the first is um, storage, obviously. Uh, the second, and we've heard a lot about storage from Joe. Um, second is compute, and then the third is really distribution, the, 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 the content distribution network aspect. And when you think about media as a workload, it really hits all of those, all of those three areas. Um, if you're doing transcoding or, um, or rendering, that's really hitting a compute type of workload. Uh, if you're distributing, say, digital cinema packages, that's certainly hitting the network distribution aspect. Um, and if you have a VOD library or you're managing dailies and things like that, that's obviously hitting storage quite heavily. So I'm going to talk about utilization a little bit. And this is a curve that you've um, probably seen before. Um, certainly, it's, it's a curve that we tend to apply to data centers in terms of utilization and capacity planning for, for data centers. But we can also apply it to other situations when you've essentially got a finite set of resources that you've got to provision. Um, that could be compute capacity. It could be LA freeway capacity, as uh, one of my friends told me about this morning on the 405. Um, could be public transport. I mean, any, anything that you kind of have to provision and, and plan for. And typically, you know, you provision for what you think you need. And if you predict your requirements correctly, then you're, then you're generally good. Um, and if your assumptions don't change, then you're in good shape. Now, of course, if you're a good architect, and everyone here is, you over, you over provision to handle spikes and things like that. So immediately then, you're actually uh, running into a situation where you, there's wastage because you're not using all of the capacity that you provisioned for. And that's all fantastic until that unexpected spike happens and then you don't have enough capacity. So then you have another problem which is customer dissatisfaction. So now you're scrambling. And so what AWS does is change those economics. You have elasticity. Um, and uh, in this case, we have elasticity for, com for um, compute, but also for storage and also for delivery. So when you need more capacity, it's there. And when you don't, you're not actually paying for it. So let's talk about what that means in the context of media. So you can tell this is a chart that I drew myself, fantastic artist that I am. Um, what I really wanted to do was to think about that whole um, uh, compute workload and elasticity in terms of, in terms of transcoding. So my made up example, which hopefully will resonate with a, with a number of you. Um, you're doing a weekly show, um, you've got some recurring processing that happens, maybe it's for your content management system, clip libraries and things like that. And that's really represented by the, the dark blue um, uh, lines. That's kind of your steady state of operation. And you know, your weekly show that you're doing, you're doing you've got your dailies, you're doing review and approvals and things like that, and that's the green um, that I've represented there. And that's what you've planned for, that's your capacity. And of course, this is my ideal world. So in my ideal world, it's really awesome. You don't have tape. You're not burning DVDs. You're not doing digi-beta and HD cam copies. It's fantastic. Uh, strongly encourage you to live there. It's great. Um, and then licensing comes along and says, wow, this is awesome. We've just inked this deal with an MSO, doing a new OTT service, and we have promised them every single episode ever of, well, name your favorite show, CSI in all regions, um, 
The Sopranos, Doctor Who, you name it, and that's my red bars up there. So you've got this multi-season request that's come in, and great, now you need to figure out how you're going to cope with that transcoding capacity. So you're scrambling, you're phoning around LA at all of the different rental houses who've got transcoders that you actually trust, um, and it, it's a problem because you've got this capacity deficit, and so that's an, ex that's an extremely good use case for, um, for the cloud. And that's a way that using the cloud and using this kind of hybrid approach of, move it, of using your on-prem um, processing capabilities and then bursting into the cloud when you actually need it is an area that Sam's going to be talking about a little bit later on. So now let's talk about how AWS itself actually fits into transcoding. So you've heard about the storage aspects. You'll hear later on about the CDN, the network distribution aspects. I'm really going to focus more on the kind of the compute type of aspects, which is really what we're interested in from a, uh, from a transcoding standpoint. So let's take a look at a typical um, live and uh, VOD transcoding plant. It's a very simplified diagram that I've actually um, uh, drawn up here. So I've got my transcoder instances, could be whatever transcoder you're actually using at the moment. Um, you've got some streams on the left, so you might have physical sources, um, physical media, a camera connected to the transcoding appliances. You've got some file-based sources, you might have some live streams coming in via RTMP, and then you've got various outputs that you're producing. So you might have some output streams and various different profiles for all the various devices that are out there, and then you might have some file-based outputs as well. And then you have some kind of workflow engine, some kind of workflow controller that's controlling all of the, the, the entire situation. So it's a fairly generic, simplified diagram, but you know, hopefully it represents something um, like what you're used to seeing. So how do we use AWS for this? Well, what we've tended to hear from a number of media companies who are doing media processing um, in the cloud today is that there's, there's essentially a three-phase kind of approach that, that people tend to use. And, um, that there's, a, there's a 19th century English expression that says there's many ways to skin a cat. So in all of these examples, there's many ways to actually accomplish what I'm talking about, and I'm not encouraging you to go ahead and skin cats. Um, so the first phase is to take your transcoder instances, and you know this could be commercial software, and we work with uh, the various transcoder companies that you're no doubt familiar with, um, and actually run some of those transcoding um, instances on EC2. So that's literally taking the on-prem transcoder that you might have today and running that on an EC2 instance. And there's various flavors of EC2 instances, various sizes, Linux versions, Windows versions, 32-bit, 64-bit, and, and so on. Um, quick aside on licensing, that there, there, there tends to be um, a lot of the commercial transcoders have various licensing types of mechanisms. I would encourage you to talk to them and talk to us. There tend to be some pretty easy ways of actually working with licensing systems, such as soft keys and so on and so forth. It's fairly natural to store the actual content as their file-based sources in, in S3 and to put the content back onto S3. And then once you've got your content back onto S3, it's a fairly logical process to actually use our content distribution network, CloudFront, to actually distribute that content. Because once it's on S3, it's immediately available to CloudFront. So this is kind of a simple phase one kind of approach of, hey, I want to do some transcoding on the cloud. So what can we do next? So let's look at some opportunities for, um, for optimization. So, you heard from Joe and you heard from Michelle earlier about ways to um, accelerate um, getting content into, um, uh, into S3 using Direct Connect. Uh, and I think one of the things that um, perhaps was mentioned but perhaps wasn't is that um, Direct Connect exists within the One Wiltshire data center. So I know a number of folks here use that data center. So you can literally do a direct fiber connection there. You get a very high speed connectivity going. Um, and then a, a sparer as well for actually optimizing the, um, um, the pipe that you have going into S3. The second area of optimization is to use the uh, Amazon VPC, Virtual Private Cloud. And what that does is it lets you essentially ring fence part of AWS and make it look like part of your own network. So it, it, you're essentially extending your data center into AWS. 
So now you have an environment that's isolated from the public internet, and it's only accessible um, via a secure channel, via your secure channel. So that tends to be very interesting for people who've got high, um, uh, high value content that they want to make sure is only available to themselves. Now let's look at how we can actually optimize some of the compute costs. There's a few ways to do that. One of them is using a concept called EC2 reserved instances. Now, EC2 reserved instances essentially let you go off and buy um, a, 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 an instance on EC2 of specific capacity, and then your hourly rate goes down as a result. And there's one-year terms for that, there's three-year terms for that as well. So you have access to this particular EC2 instance. That's great if you know that you're going to be working with a certain um, type of workload or a certain amount of compute power that you actually need. Second thing is that you can use a concept called EC2 spot instances. Now that's quite interesting because what that lets you do is to actually bid on excess Amazon EC2 capacity. And there's a couple of ways that this actually could be really interesting for media processing workloads. Um, the first is that you could, bid, you could um, do some testing and work out that you know, if I'm transcoding on a particular size EC2 instance and I move up to another bigger size EC2 instance, then I'm able to do that transcoding work much, much quicker, so I get much higher throughput. So now I could go off and I could bid on that large um, EC2 instance, and once, my, once I actually get to my bid price and I have access to that instance, my transcoding all of a sudden speeds up. So that could be a really nice way of doing things. The other thing you could do is you could say, well, look, I've got this back catalog. I'm not too concerned as to when that actually gets transcoded. I just want it transcoded someday. So I could use Spot to actually cater to that particular workload. So again, it gives you some options in terms of how you, uh, uh, how you actually pay for your compute capacity. I should say at this point that we have a number of solutions architects here. I think we have five or six of them wandering around. Um, all of the Amazon guys have um, yellow um, lanyards. So uh, maybe during the break and you have specific architectural discussions that you wish to have, it would be worth seeking out one of the solutions architects and having conversations um, with them about how this could all map to your specific scenarios. So what about the third phase? Well, third phase is really um, more along the lines of moving to a, a service-oriented architecture for transcoding and media processing in the cloud. So here you might actually create a fleet of transcode workers. And, and in this instance, what I'm really talking about is taking the transcode engine functionality, wrappering that with an API, and having a number of those spread out uh, on a fleet of EC2 instances that you then interact with through APIs. You can use your on-premise workflow controller to um, interact directly with those transcode workers. You could also use a service called Simple Workflow that we have available that's essentially a, a, a cloud-based workflow service which will enable you to integrate both with your um, on-prem workflow controller or just do the entire thing in the cloud. Another service that we have that's certainly useful for um, scheduling work is SQS, our simple queuing service. So you could think about having a transcode queue or multiple transcode queues that divvies up work to the various transcode workers that you actually have out there. And then, last but not least, we have a notification service, simple notification service, which is essentially a publish and subscribe type model, which enables you to handle notifications that might be um, taking pl that, that you might need to handle during the actual transcode or media processing workflow. And again, you really have the flexibility here to create an architecture the way that you see fit, that either you know, extends your existing workflows into the cloud or does something net new and have that communication between your on-prem and your cloud-based workflow. So let's talk about another important part of media processing, and that's about securing content. Because we provide um, infrastructure and application services, there's really many ways that you can go around about securing that content. So what I'll share now is some of the best practices that we've seen from, from some of our customers. So let's look at our source assets first. So a lot of the time what people do is to actually encrypt these source assets themselves locally. That way they maintain control over the encryption keys, and it also means that nothing unencrypted ever leaves their, their four walls or their data center. Now if we look at the network transfer aspect, again, 
what different ways to um, secure network transfer. You know, one would be through a secure network connection using SSL. If you're using the virtual private cloud um, technology that I mentioned earlier, then you're using a, a protected pipe. And again, your assets are encrypted in the first place if you've followed step one there. The next thing that most people do is um, on S3 itself, they actually um, choose to do at rest encryption. And so they'll do that using a yes, what, 256. Not sure why rest got capitalized there, but it is. And then we can look at some of the other more traditional um, media processing types of security aspects, such as digital rights management. So a number of ways to do DRM um, in the cloud. One is you could actually run your own certificate servers. Um, but another thing that you can do is to actually look at one of the software as a service providers of DRM capabilities like ByDRM. And one of our partners, um, Zencoder Outside, uh, has an integration with ByDRM that, uh, that you can talk to them about. And I know um, uh, Elemental has done some work with Ultraviolet um, in terms of DRM technologies there. And then finally, watermarking. We're seeing a renewed interest in watermarking for a number of reasons, not just securing the actual content itself, but actually doing individualization um, and as well as syncing to second screen devices, so d different ways of using watermarking there. And again, these are, these are available from various third parties, and they're typically able to run well on EC2 as a compute instance. So, to sum up, we provide um, infrastructure and application services that enable you to run media processing uh, workloads in the cloud. You can do this yourself. You can do it together with partners um, or, or directly with partners. Um, so you have the flexibility to work the way that you actually want to work within the, your current architectures. And with that, I'd like to turn the session over to Sam uh, Blackman, who's the CEO of Elemental Technologies. And um, I believe Elemental really rose to fame doing GPU transcoding. If that's correct. Exactly right. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank that's you, great. Sam. Thanks, David. All right. Well, it's great to be here in Los Angeles today. My name is Sam Blackman, CEO and co-founder of Elemental. And I always enjoy coming down to Los Angeles. The city never fails to amaze me. Uh, the hotel we're here at today, I'm not sure if folks have used the restroom, but the stalls are mirrored on every side. Is that a new trend in Los Angeles? Because it hasn't made it to Portland yet, and it is bizarre. I'll tell you, it is really strange. Anyway, it's, it's just great to be here, and I always have fun in Los Angeles. All right, so let me give you a little background on Elemental. As David mentioned, we got our start leveraging GPUs for video processing. So Elemental's about six years old, headquartered in Portland, Oregon. When we started the company, we actually wanted to build video processing that took advantage of specialized ASICs. We came from a company that had built ASICs for video processing, and we thought there was going to be this transcoding renaissance, because transcoding really was a very boring topic for about five or 10 years, 1995 to 2005. About 2007, 2008, it started to get interesting. Then the iPad came out in 2010, and all of a sudden, everyone had to have their content on multi-screen devices, and transcoding was all of a sudden the most exciting topic in the world. So, Unfortunately, we found that venture capitalists were not interested in funding another semiconductor company to build specialized ASICs to transcode video. And luckily for us, at that same time, NVIDIA released a new processor called the G80, and they released a programming language called CUDA. And we said, hmm, working with Intel and working with NVIDIA, we can take advantage of commodity off-the-shelf hardware to build very, very high-performance transcoding infrastructure. And so we kind of put our heads down for the next few years, and built a bunch of codecs from scratch, H.264, MPEG-2, VC1, decoders, encoders, image processors, scalers, deinterlacers. We built an entire video processing stack in software from the ground up, leveraging GPUs and CPUs. So it was a, a hard process. But by the end of it, we had a really nice video processing platform that we released in early 2010, initially focused on on-premise type deployments. And that's what you see up here today, our elemental video processing systems. I'll talk a little more about what they are in the next few slides. But we essentially make it very easy to take video that was destined initially for legacy video networks, cable, satellite, IPTV, or over-the-air broadcast, and repurpose that content for distribution over the internet using adaptive bitrate technologies to multi-screen devices. 
And that's kind of, that was our initial focus, and I think we've done a really good job there. I'll talk about some of our customers on, on the next slide. But more recently, we realized that customers, especially customers down here in the Southern California area, need more functionality than just distribution to adaptive bitrate type devices. If you're delivering your content to Comcast, they have 60 million set-top boxes out there that still need MPEG-2 as a delivery format. So we've added some really high-quality MPEG-2 processing to the product. Uh, if you're a post-production house, you might need to deliver to the iTunes store and use ProRes. So we've added ProRes encoding support. We support things like JPEG 2000 decoding. We support all the kind of high-performance features that enterprise customers require in their video processing workflow, which is different than I think a lot of the cloud providers who are kind of focused on leveraging open source technology to build their workflows. We actually have built the entire video stack from the ground up for enterprise video processing customers. So, you know, I can talk about it a little bit. Um, you know, we've focused from day one on the top media and entertainment companies in the world. Here's a, a small list of our customers. These are the ones that we've been able to arm twist into letting us talk about them publicly, which if any other vendors here know is not an easy process. Um, there's good reasons for that. But um, some of the ones that we're most proud of are folks like HBO, the whole HBO Go platform, which has been very successful, and Netflix, which is unfortunately not a customer today. Um, Reed Hastings has said that HBO Go is one of the, the competitors that he's most concerned about, and that service is all powered by Elemental. ABC News, their really cool iPad app that came out just a month after the iPad, had the sweet user interface where you could rotate the globe very easily, leveraging your iPad touch interface. That was one of our early customers. Um, Comcast, the Xfinity platform, so if you've leveraged Xfinity to view VOD content, if you're a Comcast subscriber, all the VOD content that Comcast provides is powered by Elemental Server for transcoding. Um, it was great to see Michelle mention their work with Delta Tray on UEFA. Delta Tray is a really important partner of ours. I think they're doing very, very innovative work in next generation sport workflows. And sports has been one of those kind of focused demographics for us. We have a lot of customers like the NBA, uh, MajorLeagueBaseball.com, if you're a subscriber to MLB TV, any of the highlights, the video on demand clips you watch on MLB TV are powered by Elemental. So a small sampling, um, we have over 140 customers now which we're pretty proud of given we've only been in the market for about two years. And some of our competitors have been in the space for many, many years. And I think Elemental really came along and innovated very uniquely by leveraging the GPU for the video processing. One of the most exciting developments that Amazon's had in the last couple of years is adding GPUs to their compute instances. So now they're still only in one region, and we're always trying to lobby Amazon to add them to more regions. But we can run on the GPUs in the Northern Virginia region. We can also run CPU in their other regions. Finally, um, just to talk about our, our final little commercial piece here, uh, the 2012 Summer Olympics was a big focus for us. You know, we're still a small company. I don't know how many people here have heard of Elemental, but I'm not going to ask for a, a hand raise just in case the results are really depressing. Um, but we thought the Summer Olympics would be a really good way to raise our profile and let folks know that, hey, this company has arrived. You can depend on us for your most important, your most monetized, your most expensive rights holding um, games. And we actually powered the Olympics in more than 70 countries. Um, we were across four different continents. And our customers streamed to over 500 million streams across these 70 countries. So everything went very, very smoothly without a hitch. And it was definitely one of the most rewarding experiences of my work with Elemental so far, because we spent a year preparing for those two weeks. And we knew that we'd probably be shot if we didn't execute, and it went OK. So, so that's kind of a, a quick background on Elemental. What I want to talk about now is how Elemental is evolving to the cloud. And like many of you, you probably come from a workflow where the data center, your colo, has been how you've built out your video processing capabilities today. That's where we come from. That's where we started from. And where we're going is, I think, really important. Um, the encoding problem that David talked about, I think, is worth highlighting again, because this is really important. You look at this diagram here, and I'm excited because this pointer has a green green light, just like Elemental. Um, here's your actual demand. As a data center manager, as the person in charge of your IT infrastructure, up until now, you've really had to predict what that demand's going to look like. And you buy a given amount of on-site infrastructure, hopefully Elemental, to support that demand. Now, you've got to stay ahead of the, the actual demand, because I think 
a lot of you have found transcoding demand has gone up very, very significantly as the number of devices that has come out has increased dramatically. And we don't really see it getting any easier. And the, the number of new features that we're asked for on a very daily basis, whether it's supporting H.265, which is the next standard after H.264, none of us know when Apple's going to release the iPhone 6 that requires H.265 to deliver to it, and all of a sudden our entire libraries have to be converted over. No one knows when. Uh, Comcast is going to ask you for another gigantic archive of video going back 40 years that you have to make available in MPEG-2. So you don't know when you're going to get hit with a spike. And if you get hit with that spike at a time when you don't have enough on-site infrastructure procured, you're in a really difficult situation because you can't fulfill your obligations. So how do you solve this? And David had a good slide on it, which was like, well, you can go 100% to the cloud, and you can just scale up and down instances with your, with your requirements. I think that's a, a really good use case if you don't have that much volume, and some of our customers certainly are kind of those type of customers who their, their average monthly or yearly volume is not too significant. But most of Elemental's customers tend to be the top tier media entertainment folks. Video is their business, their billion dollar a year business, and so they're processing a lot of video all the time, and they have to respond. So in Elemental's experience from talking to customers, this is kind of what folks would love to have available. And this is where you leverage a hybrid type of workflow. You, you procure as much on-premise infrastructure as you need to fulfill your 24 by 7 transplant requirements. And Amazon mentioned a little earlier, you know, the economics are not always in the cloud's interest. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Being flexible about whether you leverage on-premise infrastructure or cloud infrastructure from an economic perspective is really important. And then you leverage cloud resources to keep up with the, the growing demands over time. So it gives you that flexibility and scalability over time. It allows you to optimize economically how you deploy your cloud processing resources, how you deploy your on-premise transporting resources, and leverage the resources that you already have. Because going to the cloud is going to be very exciting and something that we all work on over time. But most of us have a lot of on-premise infrastructure today that we want to leverage and not just throw away in a, a kind of quick rush to the cloud. So a hybrid workflow is where we really see the, the most optimization of video resources. All right, so this is the solution that Elemental has, has come to grips around. It's something we've been building out for the last year. I think folks have realized these are non-trivial decisions around moving to the cloud. And any simplistic answers about how you only have to save your files in one format or transcode to Apple HLS and you're done. No, that's not the way it's going. There's more and more formats that are being required by customers. So this is a, a, a lot to take in. I'm going to go through it point by point so it's not too overwhelming. But this is what the overall workflow can and should look like over time for an economically optimized solution. So first, this is how a lot of our customers are set up today. And I think a lot of folks here are probably Elemental customers today. We have several on-premise products. There's software that runs Elemental Server. This is our video on demand transcoding system. It takes pretty much any kind of file in, can transcode to all the different adaptive bitrate outputs very, very rapidly, leveraging CPU and GPU resources. We support all the main standards, whether it's Apple HLS, Adobe Dynamic Streaming, or HTTP Dynamic Streaming, Microsoft Silverlight Smooth Streaming, all the main distribution formats, as well as some of those advanced formats I mentioned earlier, like ProRes like JPEG 2000, um, and of course the encryption standards that are becoming more important. If you're working here in Hollywood and your studio has to comply with the DEC ultraviolet sunrise date, which is coming up very quickly, you need to have support for ultraviolet very quickly. If your cloud vendor doesn't have that, you're going to be in a, a really difficult position. We support all those kind of enterprise class features and containers. Um, below Elemental Server, we have our live product, Elemental Live, which is a live streaming system. It takes MPEG-2 transport stream inputs or HDSDI inputs and creates all the different adaptive bitrate outputs, same type of formats, Apple HLS, Microsoft Silverlight Smooth Steaming, um, Adobe Dash, and others. And both live and server are based on the very same software architecture, but they have different application layers on top. Obviously, server is really optimized for very, very fast file-based transcoding, which can be much faster than real time, while live is optimized for many, many concurrent streams. So we can run as many as 32 concurrent outputs today, moving to 64 with the next generation of hardware that's coming very soon. Elemental Conductor is kind of the linchpin to our strategy as a company. 
Conductor is our video management system that allows you to deploy many channels of Elemental Live today. It will soon allow you to deploy many, many Elemental servers as well. It's how you can control very large deployments of Elemental systems, whether they're running on-premise or whether they're running in the cloud. And having one centralized management system that allows you to control on-premise, cloud, or a hybrid combination of both is a very powerful concept because you no longer have to figure out how you're going to manage the resources in the different types of infrastructure. Elemental Conductor will allow you to do that for live, for server, and for stream. And finally, Stream, uh, talked about quickly here. Elemental Stream is our latest product. Um, it's essentially a packager product. So if you have a lot of adaptive bitrate files stored or you have a lot of adaptive bitrate streams in one type of format, say H.264 with AAC audio, Elemental Stream can package those into all the different types of outputs, so you don't have to re-transcode for just a container change of your content. So it allows you to really optimize use of any files that you have already in adaptive bitrate formats. So that's the on-premise today. What we're adding and what we have on demonstration right outside, and I, I really encourage people if they're interested to come take a look because it's so cool, uh, is the Elemental Cloud platform. And Elemental Cloud is a complete platform that sits on top of all these cool Amazon tools that you've been hearing about today and allows you to leverage all of Elemental's homegrown video processing software in the Amazon public cloud. It's a purpose-built platform designed to securely manage high-volume enterprise class video. So it's designed for customers like you, like customers here. Um, it allows complete auto-scaling of resources in a very parameterizable way. So you can spin up and down nodes at your choice. You have complete control. You can specify how deep the queue is before you spin up additional nodes. You can specify a maximum number of nodes you spin up. So it gives you complete control over the processing and you don't get yourself into trouble in terms of spinning up too many nodes. Yet have control over how fast they get spun up so you can turn around time. You can set the turnaround time to anything you need. We've really focused on reliability. So we used the redundant EC2 um, multiple availability zones in the system, completely auto-provisioned for you. If you spin up multiple instances in a given region, they're spun up across the multiple availability zones. So if one availability zone goes down, you're still okay and have processing capability on another zone. We also use the Amazon Relational Database System. So it's the Relational Database Service. So everything is backed up and, and very secure, reliable, and redundant. You're not going to lose any of the video that's being processed in the cloud. For professional enterprise class customers, I think another real key is security. So this system is completely built in inside for each individual customer inside the virtual private cloud. So you have complete control of your content. There's not other folks running in the virtualization system on Amazon. It's running in your VPC. And those VPCs also span the multiple availability range, multiple availability zones. So you can run that VPC across multiple zones and have all the redundancy and reliability. Finally, um, from a management perspective, we use all the monitoring and alerting standards that Amazon provides and bring that all into a given uh, a single dashboard inside Elemental Cloud. So it's very, very easy for you to see how many resources you're using how many, over time. And again, the demo that we can show you will fire off, say, 100 transcode jobs, see how they get spun up, see how they get spun down. We really optimize so that the fact that in most Amazon cases you're paying per hour, you can optimize that use of that hour and only spin up the right amount of nodes to get everything done in that hour, but not be going over. All right, um, a few more details. I think from the amount we've talked about transfer, and Aspera is phenomenal in terms of improving this. Getting content into and out of the cloud is one of the biggest challenges for customers like yourselves. These moving petabytes of data around is a huge, difficult problem. Um, of course, there's the S3 multi-part download that's built into Am uh, Elemental's Elemental Cloud product. So when you're connecting to your S3 instance, we use multi-part download to connect and get data from S3 and back to S3 very quickly. Um, it's also very important to, collect, to create your deployments near your source. So if you're uploading content to Amazon, you want to pick a region that's near your, near your data center. And I think the direct connect technology that Amazon's been building where you can actually peer your data center directly to a, a nearby Amazon data center is going to be very valuable for a lot of folks that are starting to look at Glacier and some of those processing opportunities. Um, live is something we've been looking at. You know, I think there's going to be a, important, we have a product 
it, that's a feature being built into Elemental Server called Conditioner, which conditions live streams for delivery to the cloud. You're probably not going to plug an HDSDI input into Amazon directly, but you can run an HDSDI input into an LML system on premise and then have it create the live streams that go to Amazon and then get created into the adaptive bitrate for distribution. All right. Um, final question or final um, aspect here. This is all completely seamlessly integrated. So if you have an elemental cluster today and you want to scale seamlessly using the cloud, you can use Elemental Conductor with your current servers. You can use it with your current lives to just scale up and leverage cloud resources as your workload grows. And I think this flexibility and this giving you control but keeping it simple is going to really help optimize economically how you deploy your cloud video processing. I think this is going to be a really good strategy, a good way for folks to leverage best-in-class, enterprise-class video processing resources, but get all the scalability and flexibility benefits of the cloud. So that's what I had for today. Um, please come see us. We've got a booth, unfortunately no label, but uh, we're right outside the door here and have a, a nice demo up and running, so please take the time to, to come check it out. And now I have the honor of introducing the next speaker one of Elemental's most forward-looking customers. Ericsson is a company I'm sure everyone's heard of. They're one of the largest mobile and video infrastructure providers in the world. Um, I'm introducing Raj. I asked him how he wanted to be introduced. He said, just say Raj. I said, great. <laughs> so Raj, welcome. Thank you so much. Looking forward to hearing Thank about you your Sam. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I ask uh, people to call me Raj for, for all the obvious reasons. But my whole name is Narayanan Rajan. Maybe if I sing a little bit, like Prince, I'll just get Raj to stick as a standalone name. You don't want that. Um, so you know something like uh, AWS is a, is a universally accepted platform when you've got both um, Disney, which my kids can't seem to get enough of, and Ultimate Fighting Championship that I have to go behind my wife to watch <laughs> talking, up, talking up at the same venue. And we see this kind of universal acceptance uh, of the cloud, not only from an, from an operational organization point of view, but we see it from an end consumer point of view as well. So Ericsson does an annual survey through our consumer labs division. And we interview about 100,000 people to ask them you know, what they think the trends are in media, what they think the trends are in mobile and social. And we aggregated the 10 hottest trends. And number six on that trend from the perspective of the consumer was the cloud because of the ease of use. And I think this is a very common theme we're seeing. And the fact that it's propagated all the way down to the end consumer is, is very telling. So I want to talk about three things uh, today. Number one, I want to talk about the Ericsson drivers for getting into media and, uh, and, and the cloud. Um, I also want to talk about the Ericsson Watchpoint content management system, which is the solution that we have started to migrate into AWS. And then I want to talk a little bit about our experiences with Ericsson content management as a service using the CMS solution at the core. And uh, a little bit about the performance we've seen in AWS. So Ericsson, when we talk about drivers, Ericsson, as Sam mentioned, is quite possibly one of the largest network infrastructure providers in the world. So when we think about drivers, we really think about it from the perspective of network utilization. And we see four things in the media space that are really growth drivers in terms of network utilization and bandwidth utilization. So the first thing is digital TV subs. So we view it from a global perspective. Um, and we look at emerging markets as well as developed economies. And we expect the number of digital TV subs to double in the next five years. The second thing is the growth of VOD and time-shifted TV, which is really influencing the consumption patterns that we're seeing amongst the consumers. The third thing is the growth in HDTV, both from a subscriber perspective, number of people who are watching HDTV, and the number of channels that are offered in HDTV with the obvious implications in terms of bandwidth utilization. And finally, uh, the growth of video on the web. 
and this overlaps a little bit with some of the other areas as well, which is resulting in an explosion of video traffic. And it's kind of led us to forecast that video will exceed 70% of the mobile data traffic by 2016. Now, I've heard this number you know, dozens and dozens of times, and it's a conservative estimate. I've heard other companies provide higher estimates as well. And, and it astounds me, right? Basically, I mean, we're, if we're consuming video 70% of the time when we use data on mobile or other mobile devices, we're asym asymptotically approaching, you know, couch potato hood, basically. So, <laughs> but then I remind myself, in my more optimistic phase, it's probably all educational content, so that's awesome. <laughs> right? So, so when you look at, um, you know, what, what the growth drivers are, are doing for us in terms of the solution drivers, we look at three main areas. The first is, obviously, because we're a networking company, efficient network usage. That relates directly to adaptive bit rate uh, that has been talked about several times, and also about new compression algorithms to allow us to stream more efficiently. The second piece of it, uh, in terms of our solution drivers, are multi-screen user experience and multi-screen service delivery platforms. And the third piece is managed services. So one of the things I, I think we've all observed over the last decade is this compression of technology life cycles and this increased velocity of innovation, which only makes it more and more of an issue for at least the customers that we talk to. And it's taking them away from their core business of providing services to their customers and interacting with their customers in a meaningful way to worry more about what their technology platform looks like. So, so what Ericsson has kind of gone out and said, um, and we've got a service organization of some 30,000 people, a significant portion of which is actually dedicated to managed services. We said, look, let us worry about managing a technology platform and you worry about you know, building the services you need to build for your customer. And in the media space, in the last couple of years, um, we started investing in terms of managed broadcast services as well. So we created this group called EBS, and we started out with uh, the playout operations, managing the playout operations for Canal Plus and, and TV4 in the Nordics. And uh, this year, we announced the acquisition of the playout operations of Technicolor that expands those services uh, throughout the rest of Europe. So we ingest about 200,000 assets a year, and we manage the playout for about 200 channels. <clears throat> so what that means is, when we look at platforms like AWS, and we look at different media technologies, we look at it not just from the perspective of being a vendor, we also look at it from the perspective of being a consumer. So let me talk a little bit about the TV product portfolio, just so that you know where the Ericsson content management sits. In the context of our TV product portfolio, we have access products that span all the verticals, satellite, cable, telco, terrestrial, media processing and transport. That's with our compression equipment and our head-end infrastructure. We've also got core services like back office solutions as well as service layer and applications like our IPTV middleware and our mobile TV client. And feeding into all of this is our content management system, which really provides the automated content workflow and a pretty powerful engine to do metadata transformation. And then surrounding all of that is my favorite area, which is services, which allows us to effectively deploy and distribute uh, our product portfolio. So uh, let me jump into then describing the Ericsson Watchpoint content management system in a little bit more detail. So the Watchpoint CMS was really built for a world where we're seeing more and more content from more and more diverse resources going to more and more screens, and this is only going to exponentially grow over the next 10 years. I don't think we can even imagine what kind of devices we're going to be consuming content from five, six years from now, to users who want more and more control in terms of how they consume that content. So the way we describe uh, the Ericsson Watchpoint CMS, 
if, if I may add quite humbly, is the Ericsson WatchPoint CMS is the only enterprise class, end-to-end, -end, true multi-platform product that addresses the creation, delivery, and distribution challenges associated with the multi-screen world. So, I'm going to continue to read off the slide a little bit, just for the top part, because I think there's a piece there that's quite important. It's also a centralized multi-platform content management system with business-definable workflows. So, ultimately, the management of content for most of our customers, and our customers tend to be tier one operators, is a business process. They have a business process that involves a lot of legacy equipment, that involves a lot of different organizations that do different things within their context. And so when they look at the content management system, they're looking at something that not only takes any content type and transforms it, any metadata type and transforms it, but they're also looking for something that's flexible and adaptable enough that's able to take any business process and wrap around that and provide our customer with a single searchable unified interface to manage their content workflow operations. So if you look at the CMS architecture from a modular point of view, uh, and if you get lost, we've got a key here at the bottom to kind of clue you in to what is standard and what is optional. We've got a bunch of standard modules. We've got a bunch of optional modules. And the standard modules uh, the key things I want to highlight are the workflow module, which is a template-based operations engine that really provides the level of customization a lot of our customers need in order to manage their content workflow end-to-end. -end. We've got the content library, which is the Oracle-based asset library for organizing the different packages, preview, trailer, poster art, metadata, etc. And we've also got... Uh, a host of other standard modules, the most important of which is probably the metadata, the metadata module, which allows customers not only to transform metadata from any input format to any output format, but also allows customers to ingest metadata and enhance metadata from other resources like IMDB, Rotten Tomatoes, Rovi, etc. And then all of this is built on an adapter framework. So the adapter framework allows us to plug in any third-party resource into the CMS automated workflow engine. And that's important because content workflows are going to continuously evolve. They're going to continuously adapt. We have some of our critical partners integrated into that adapter framework today, such as Elemental. Sam talked about his product, Aspera. Uh, Michelle talked about her product. And we've got a host of others as well. And we provide the capacity for our customers to adapt their legacy gear into the CMS product as well, solution as well. And, and the reason I talk about all of this before I go into the next section is we're not talking about evolving a monolithic application into the AWS cloud. We're talking about really taking a fairly complex ecosystem that's built uh, primarily for on-premise deployment and transitioning that and working to transition that into AWS. So a little bit about uh, then how, how we went from uh, you know, the WatchPoint CMS is on-prem product to, to talking about CMS and AWS. So when we had conversations with our customers, a lot of them, again, like I mentioned before, on the managed service side said, look, we want someone else to worry about the technology operations. We want to worry about our core business. So we said, fine, you know, what we can do is we can take this entire CMS ecosystem and we can put this in our data center and we can manage the whole thing for you end to end. So what that would look like is uh, the customer, the operator, would negotiate the content rights with the content owner and then the content owner would then hand off the content to us and we'd do all the functions we did within the CMS ecosystem, and then hand off the finished package to our customer service delivery platform. So some of the standard workflows would be uh, ingesting the content, ingress QCing the content to ensure it met the customer's uh, quality requirements, 
transforming the content, again, both from a metadata perspective and from a video asset perspective, egress QCing the content and then delivering it, and then also introducing some additional sub-workflows as required, generating low-res proxies, pushing it off to third-party providers for subtitling or audio dubbing, and also encryption where required. So as we got engaged in this, we started, we started kind of in, uh, getting involved in the conversation. Well, you know, there is a lot of capital investment in managing this type of service out of a data center. And, um, and, and so we heard of this cloud thing, and cloud is actually a very big initiative within Ericsson in its own right in terms of the services we provide for our telco customers. <clears throat> so we started to look at what was available out there. And why cloud, number one, obviously we want to decouple the software deployment from the hardware investment. The second thing was uh, faster time to market. How many guys in here have actually used the AWS interface to launch an AMI instance? Raise your hand. Okay. So, so some of you have. A lot of you haven't. I was amongst the group that hadn't until about a week ago. <laughs> I went, to my, I went to one of my engineers and I said, well, I'm going to go give this talk at this AWS digital media conference. And uh, so I, I want to know what I'm talking about. Show me what you're doing. So I had my cup of coffee. I was ready to sit there for like about an hour or so as he went through the whole process. And it was literally like some of the descriptions you've heard here. It's like three or four clicks. Five minutes later, I've had two sips of coffee. And the thing is launched. I'm simplifying it. But, and, and there's a lot of upfront work that goes to making it possible. But it, it, was, it was really surprising to me, the delta between what it takes to launch a CMS instance in AWS versus bringing it up in our, in our physical infrastructure. Platform efficiencies and scalability. Again, we talk about launching insta instances very quickly. Uh, I think a lot of folks have talked about how that allows you to scale very effectively. Increased solution robustness versus the amount of hardware dollars spent. This is, again, the geographically disparate instances that you can deploy. A lot of folks have talked about this as well. But there are a couple of folks out there offering cloud services. So why AWS? So the first thing was platform compatibility. So uh, I think Warner mentioned this earlier. There is a multiple flavors of OS stacks that were available. We run CMS on a Red Hat Linux variant. And that was readily available. Uh, database compatibility. Our backend database for, for CMS is, is, is Oracle. That was readily available. Partner compatibility. We've already talked about Elemental. We've talked about Aspera and other partners who are part of our ecosystem uh, and, and others that we haven't mentioned also moving into AWS. So that, that notion of a community moving to that ecosystem was also readily available. And security. So. Uh, all the folks who, who are involved in content know, knows what a touchy subject this is. And we were able to kind of check off uh, that aspect of it from our list as well. So it was a very natural progression from us, for us, very easy decision to make to kind of say, okay, let's start migrating this thing into AWS. So we are doing it in two phases. The first phase is really this hybrid approach. And, and Sam talked about this, which is where you have uh, a significant portion of your resources on-prem, and you put some critical resources out into the Amazon cloud and burst up to it as you need it. And Elemental has done a great job in terms of making it easy to uh, integrate that local transcoder infrastructure with a cloud-based transcoder infrastructure. Uh, also, S3 storage, in terms of making cheap storage available. I can't tell you how excited I am to hear about Glacier, by the way. Um, and the one piece that's up here that, that we really haven't migrated all the way yet is, um, is quality control. So we've got certain vendors that we use that are on-prem, and we're still looking for the right candidates to, to move that all the way. So we're still very much in, in pre-production phase there because our customers play, 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 uh, place that, that QC at a very high premium. So, and this is, this is where we're moving towards. So this is what we're testing right now. Again, that QC portion of it is not quite there yet, where almost everything is up in the cloud, but we do have a local 
test environment uh, where we test our customized templates, our template modifications, etc., before we move it off into production. So the key elements we have, uh, just to repeat, uh, that we're using in AWS, the S3 storage, the Aspera piece, the Elemental Cloud piece, the Content Management as a Service, and our portal, which is the interface for our customers into our as a service platform. And um, that's all great, and it's easy to use, but one of the questions that I asked, because uh, I'm clearly not on the ball as, as the rest of my team, I said, look, guys, uh, it's fantastic that you put all this stuff in the cloud, and it's easy to use, and we scale very easily, but what is the penalty that you pay, if any, in terms of moving something from my data center, where I have a local storage array, I've got a local network, I've got local transcoders, I've got my local applications, to moving everything into a virtual environment. Because if it takes me 3x the amount of time to process an asset in a virtual environment, because of the limitations of different components within the ecosystem talking to each other or transferring files back and forth, then it's a great story, but it's not worth it from a business perspective. So uh, the last piece I want to leave you with here is, based on our initial tests, what we've found is that penalty is almost non-existent. There's a 10 to 15% overhead, depending on what you're trying to do, which is completely acceptable in terms of the cost benefit. And, uh, and it basically comes back down to you know, our survey uh, with the consumers, right? It's a cloud, it's easy to use. That's what we believe and that's the direction we're headed in. So thank you. Oh wait, hold on, hold on, hold on a second. All right, I got, uh, I forgot uh, that I need to introduce Martin from Intel, who has two names. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I have two names. And uh, everyone calls me Leslie, so it's, uh, it's uh, just something I've grown used to. Well, it's real exciting to see you know, all the focus on digital media that uh, Amazon is providing, uh, helping the time to market for all these companies. Intel has really felt strongly about the digital media uh, for some time. As we know, it spins a lot of uh, CPU cycles, and it's very important. So. Through the years, we've tried a lot of different instances. You may have remember Vive. We've been trying to get people in front of their TV in the center of the experience for some time. And I can tell you from experience, I've been at Intel 15 years, focus on digital media for the last seven or eight. It's not easy. People like their TVs and the way they, they view their content now is evolving. So we love it that the fact that Amazon is creating such an environment for all these companies to bring solutions to bring a fast time to market. That's great because we want to see people consuming content everywhere all the time. I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll see more products coming from uh, uh, Intel soon. Everyone's talking scale up. Everything scale up, scale up. We see the scale up the need because we need to get more content out there. We've got the Olympics was a great example what they're doing with the Olympics. Um, as well as uh, HBO, I'm a big Game of Thrones fan, and uh, love my second screen experience, and now almost cannot live without it. But everybody's scaling up and up because there's more users, uh, they need more infrastructure, they need more time to market, scaling for burst. These are absolutely all the things that the digital media industry has been needing for a long time to help with this time to market. Things move fast here, and things get stale fast here. So we want to be very quick. But while everybody else is scaling up, I have to say, Intel is focusing on scaling down. And when I say scale down, I'm talking about, and, and by the way, I'm probably the only presentation here without a media workflow. So this is just kind of a, a palate cleanser here very quickly. I just want to talk about what's on the heart of the inside of uh, some of the clouds and a big portion of Amazon Cloud. I'm not legally uh, able to say exactly what pieces, but we'll keep you guessing. And uh, you can just imagine, if your media is getting processed extremely fast, those must be Intel processors behind there. <laughs> On that topic of uh, Intel processors, and I don't know if this is really uh, relevant for a lot of the audience, but I thought it would be interesting. Um, we're now building our microprocessor on 22 nanometers. So everyone's scaling up, but really the race in technology is scaling down. 
how to make that transistor smaller, more efficient, uh, more power efficient, uh, to drive more feature sets that people like uh, the media industry want. It's always about you know, how fast can we encode? How fast can we transcode? And we have a lot of great partners here. We work side by side with them. We work uh, alongside also with uh, even our competitors uh, NVIDIA, for example, so that we can all come together to deliver these, these types of solutions that uh, are being streamed through here. So at the heart of this data center is this little, little, tiny 22 nanometer based microprocessor uh, called Xeon. Anybody heard of Xeon in this crowd? One, two, okay, one guy. There's another Intel guy back there. So this is based on 22 nanometer, and what it is doing is actually processing all these all these little uh, bytes and bits. And as the the hunger and the and the need for uh, faster, uh, bigger pipes uh, come along, and we love it because the digital media guys, uh, along with oil and gas and financial services. Um, really drive us hard. I mean, when we bring our engineers in to say like the, the Disney's and the Sony's and they say, tell us what you have coming, they have very specific needs on what they want and how they want to see their, their content displayed. So we've been spending a lot of time making the changes um, that will help the media industry compute uh, uh, packets much faster for delivering either on the, the client device whether it be uh, phones, uh, ultrabooks, uh, tablets by anyone, and or even on the server side. So our focus is a little bit on the end-to-end. -end. And it's not that easy. I think there's uh, been brought up compatibility a lot. Can you imagine have to be backward compatible for every product you almost ever made? That's, that's a challenge for Intel. I mean, we just can't scrap it and go, here's a new one. So we have to focus on what's the next generation going to need? What are the new codecs? How are we going to process those codecs even faster. So it actually comes back down to the transistor and this architecture. Now this architecture, I'm just going to point out there will not be a test on this one, but what we've done specifically for media is we've actually increased the I.O. There's, there's been the need for moving more and more data. Um, we're constantly, our job at Intel, in Intel Architecture Labs, is to focus on what we do is chasing the bottlenecks. There's always a bottleneck somewhere. I don't care if we had the perfect solution. Somebody would stand back and go, there's the bottleneck. So we've been doing that for some time. So focusing on the, uh, on the bottleneck has been a, a very, very big uh, uh, job, uh, especially on we see services, I'm sorry, uh, data coming east and west and north and south within uh, either your cloud or your internet. So we're seeing a lot of uh, east to west side-to-side -side communications, very cool uh, technologies coming out with some mesh fabric, um, very nice stuff. How do we play in there? So we focus on the Xeon as our number one go-to product in this space, and I believe Amazon feels the same way. One of the big focus areas, though, is power consumption. Of course, we all have the security, uh, you know, everything, uh, security, uh, uh, efficiencies, all things play. But what is very, very important is the cost of the power comes down. So our latest generation, based on a 22 nanometer transistor, actually reduces that power nearly in half. In fact, uh, a lot of render farms that have uh, gone up on this new technology, we actually felt that there was an issue. There must be something wrong because our servers are not consuming that much power. So it's very nice because uh, I've been at Intel 15 years. We haven't always had that reputation. Sometimes we took a lot of power. It just so happens that the race to the smaller transistor has been very helpful to us. So within our last generation, one of the big focuses was turbo. Everybody loves turbo, right? Remember the button? Everybody used to have the button on their turbo computer. Well, it's been good and bad for us through the years, but with our newest architecture, turbo has really turned out incredibly well for us. So while those Amazon instances uh, well, I'm sure they're almost always running 24 hours a day. But in between, our turbo capabilities and our efficiencies, because we use such an efficient transistor, we're able to kind of kick down power. Uh, like I said, even to the case where some customers thought the performance is there, but there must be something wrong because they're not pulling enough power. So we're glad to say that the servers are running beautifully. We're saving lots of power. And about 70% of all applications available today already take advantage of this. Now, it may not be totally relevant in your workflow and why you needed to know this. I just wanted to give you background since we had a beautiful commercial spot here to let you know it's major focus for us. Uh, in a lot of IT surveys that we do with uh, uh, CIOs and et cetera, power constantly comes up. 
It's the cost of the power. In fact, you could even argue that that is one of the reasons why Amazon is doing so well. Because they don't want, they, meaning uh, any end users, don't want to incur all these extra costs of infrastructure, especially if they're bursting, right? This special, this beautiful area. I think you did a great job, my gentleman from Elemental, uh, saying capturing these spaces for, for burst and then developing a, a good inner working with Amazon. So it's been our focus to deliver the products. Uh, by the way, Amazon's a pretty tough customer too. I don't get to directly call on the team, but my peers do, and I can tell you, it's, uh, they're, they're driven pretty hard by the Amazon team to deliver great products. In fact, all of our partners are. I think you've heard from most of our partners in the room, so it's just a, uh, a great opportunity for us to, to get up and uh, present. So, if any of you remember, probably the best commercial that Intel ever did, it had to been uh, in the 90s, and it was the Dancing Bunny Men. The, I don't, won't ask anybody to uh, remember that one, but I personally think that was the best ever. And that was, I think, our first foray into uh, media processing. I know I was trained specifically to say uh, Intel with MMX technology. We had to say it specifically that way because we introduced new instruction sets that handled video within our microprocessor. Something kind of new, video was just coming about. Our, one of our founders, Andy Grove, was very excited about video and thought one day we'll have a billion connected PCs Everybody said he was kind of nuts at the time. It was a little far-reaching. We were still at 10 megabit networks, you know, locally. So it was, a, it was a really interesting time. But since MMX technology, which is a portion of you, a uh, portion within the microprocessor that handles video uh, and video execution, um, that has continually advanced. So this year with the latest round of servers and what you see in a, a component of, uh, of Amazon is processors that have the capability, capabilities of, of doing more advanced instructions. So wider, faster paths. Like I said, standing back, looking at the bottlenecks. Where are the bottlenecks? How can we do that? SIMD uh, is uh, CPU processing graphics. So now our next is AVX. So we're increasing the tool set available for the media companies to take advantage of, whether it be within the workflow, uh, whether it be back on the uh, uh, storage. Anywhere that media processing is done, we want to be there and enable this to happen. So AVX is our latest generation there. And let me just say it's, it's uh, performing quite well. So. You cannot have hardware without software. And, and I, it's always going back and forth. Everyone's like, oh, well, you guys just make the hardware. We do the hard part. We do the software. It, honestly, it's, it takes all of us. It takes a village, basically, to raise a cloud, right? So, so in this, um, a lot of our time is spent with uh, end users that are trying to get their code in the media space, either making movies, making games, my favorite part, Blizzard, Activision, fun, fun companies to play with. They use a lot of our tools, and probably a lot of the partners that are selling solutions here are using some of our software tools. So I kind of wanted to do a little bit of a, a highlight of our tool set. Our tool sets are made to, to, oh, sorry about that. Our tool sets are made for end users to take their code, and, and this has been a, and excuse me, I'm not calling anyone's children ugly here. I'll just right off the bat uh, say that. But not all code in Hollywood is highly parallel. Everybody agree with that? It's very, some of these workloads are very difficult. Encode transcode is beautiful. It's simple. It's, well, I won't say it's simple. Let me, let me back off. Um, but it's, it's kind of straightforward in what it's doing. Uh, when you get into big render farms and, and some very complex code that these studios have spent years and decades of, of putting together, um, a big focus of mine here in town, my job, is to work with these studios on these software tools. So a lot of these software tools then have the capability of write once, run many. So the different areas, uh, and a few of these are future speculating, especially uh, many core. Today we're in an area of multi-core. We see eight cores. By the way, not all cores are created equal. If there's anything you remember from my presentation as you walk out of this room today, remember, not all cores are created equal. You can have a whole bunch of uh, bad cores. That doesn't mean you have a great product. Having good cores at the right balance for the right customer is the right thing. And our software tools help extract that. Um, something that I want to bring up, because it's future, 
speaking, and this is not in the Amazon cloud right now, I just want to make sure of this, but anytime Intel uh, usually gets on the stage, they can talk a little bit about future roadmaps. Um, we see the uh, high performance computing side of this uh, growing hugely, the big data side of this growing hugely. Everybody's workflow had some kind of arrow that pointed to something that looked like big data. Well, big data and supercomputing is something that Intel has been very good at for a long, long time. Um, it's a different workload. Like I said, I didn't want to you know, penalize anybody by saying that a lot of workloads in town are not highly uh, parallel because it's, it's very difficult. Uh, but now we're actually getting to an age, kind of like as we're seeing here, the, the momentum that Amazon has with their development and workflow crowds, crowds customers, to uh, bring something together to make it easy to fire up so you can get a time to market. Um, we're seeing the, the same thing in other areas. So we're definitely uh, really excited to see high performance computing, cloud, Hadoop, big clusters, uh, big old applications that need a lot of uh, MIPS sucking apps. We, we love that. I don't know if that's a politically correct term. But the more cycles that these apps turn, the more we love it and the more we actually tune for it. So we will continue to work with Amazon to listen to what they need, to deliver the products that then will hopefully service uh, their customers and their partners. And with that, that was a short commercial break. Thank you very much.